If you enjoy today's content, then please consider supporting Top Hat Gaming Man on Patreon. Yeah! Hello, ladies! Top Hat Gaming Man here. Last week on this channel, we looked at the very first games consoles to offer online services in the form of both the Atari VCS's game line from 1983 and the even earlier Intellivision Play Cable from 1980. It is quite astounding, really, that platforms were achieving these sort of feats such a long time ago. I feel stories like this appear to be often overlooked due to the fact that most of YouTube seems to be locked in its boring, oversaturated Nintendo, Sega, Sony retro gaming bubble. Despite being forgotten, these baby steps were the first of many that would eventually lead to services such as the PlayStation Network and Xbox Live two expertly implemented services that act as cornerstones of console gaming today. In the far corner of console gaming, believe it or not, Nintendo too offer their own online services. However, Nintendo's online gaming presence is questionable at best. Nintendo Gaming Online has always been somewhat gimped and hindered by the company's somewhat conservative and protectionist business practices, all in all contributing to a low quality product, which has always been detrimental to both the end consumer and Nintendo themselves as a whole, which makes you wonder what their whole goal is to begin with sometimes. What makes all of this more alarming is that out of Nintendo, Microsoft and Sony, not only did Nintendo have a running head start in the console business, as we all know, but they were offering online services on their games consoles from as early as the bloody 1980s. This is the story of Nintendo's first steps into games consoles online. Yeah! To begin this story, we have to first look to the NES itself. Known to most, this ugly grey box hides a port on the underside of the console. In many youngsters' childhoods, youthful rapscallions would jump to all sorts of conclusions in regards to the possibilities in which this concealed slot or wizard sleeve could possibly be for. What could you possibly insert into this mysterious hole? This was a question in which many young boys sought to answer. I would gather that to this day, many of my fan base have probably yet to find out. <laughs> Anyway, playground rumours were rife about this kind of thing, with crazy accusations surfacing that this port could be used to play Sega Master System games, of all things on your NES. In reality though, the expansion port was in many ways much like a USB port today, and could have been potentially utilised in a number of different ways. The obvious of course, being used for the potential development of an NES disk drive. However of course, this was never to come to fruition due to the fact that Nintendo quickly soured towards this technology as a result of piracy apparently being rife on Nintendo's Japanese Famicom Disk System counterpart. Another use for this port was that a modem was developed which could be inserted into the bottom of the NES, known as the Teleplay modem, a device I have found rarely talked about online, which I found insanely bizarre considering how obsessed most American gamers are with the Nintendo Entertainment System. Therefore, you would expect this thing to get mentioned every couple of seconds online. The Teleplay modem was developed by Keith Rupp and Nolan Bushnell, the founder of Atari Incorporated, of all things. The man who is to sum the founder of console gaming as we know it which makes this story even more shocking that it is so overlooked. The Teleplay modem was primarily designed to provide online play between NES users, however it also possessed capabilities for compatibility with the Sega Genesis as well. The prototype of this device was unveiled at the 1992 Consumer Electronics Show and received a somewhat favourable reception. Known at the time as the IOTA modem, the device featured a maximum speed of just 300 bits per second, which made the device 
too slow to have been able to render full screen NES quality graphics, which would have been typical of the average game of the time. Nolan Bushnell's involvement in this project was fairly short lived. However, Keith Rupp continued to develop the modem, eventually himself giving it the name the Teleplay Modem. Under his leadership, he managed to increase the speed of the device to 2,400 bits per second. During this time frame, Rupp conceived another idea, which was also many decades ahead of its time. Rupp intended this device to feature the ability to allow crossplay of certain titles between users of both the Nintendo Entertainment System and the Sega Genesis, a rather earth-shattering concept which I would gather would have seemed almost unfathomable at the time, considering how protectionist these large Japanese companies are, especially back then. This is a feature which has only come into fruition in the last year or two, and even now it feels pretty unbelievable that it's even happened. There were three exclusive games which were developed for this modem, which were intended to take advantage of this unusual feature. They were Battlestorm, Terran Wars and Sea Battle. However, none of these titles saw the light of day, as to the surprise of none. Both Nintendo and Sega outright refused to license the Teleplay modem, so clearly the technology was there for much greater things to have been achieved with these platforms. However, stubborn and paranoid Japanese businessmen hindered further progress being achieved in the field of crossplay for many years to come. With Sony, for example, only finally allowing crossplay within the last few weeks. So, that was the end of the Teleplay modem, but this isn't where the story of the NES Online ends quite yet. So, let's take a look at what was happening over in Japan itself, with the Japanese variant of the system well known as the Famicom. Back in the 1980s, Nintendo dappled with connecting the Famicom to the internet. In 1988, five years after the death of the Atari game line, which passed away in 1983, Nintendo decided to have a go at creating their own online peripheral for the Famicom. They would dub this machine the Famicom Modem, and intended to offer services and connect people with each other. Weirdly enough, despite the fact this service was conducted via the Famicom, it was never actually used for playing games, making this a very different venture to that of the Teleplay modem. The most gaming related thing you could possibly achieve with this device was that it allowed you to access the Super Mario Club, which contained reviews and previews. The reason why allegedly you couldn't play any games on this thing was because it was going to be far too costly, in fact as much as several dollars per hour to do so. This modem was a result of a collaboration between Nintendo and a Japanese brokerage called Nomura Securities. The modem focused predominantly on banking and stock trading. How fun for the children! Apparently, Nomura were just looking for a more high-tech and modern way for their customers to be able to peruse stock exchange and carry out trades. Absurd! I mean, did Nintendo really think this was going to boost sales on their side of things? I know we will just have an all-in-one device that offers gaming for the kids and a bit of banking for mummy and daddy, which isn't that mad I suppose when you think about it. It's basically just made the Famicom um, an iPad. The Famicom modem is a peripheral which was inserted into the top of the Famicom, plugged into the cartridge slot, much like the NEC PC Engine. It used a card-based format. The system itself behaved as a modem would, connecting the Famicom to a server through a standard network cable provided by Nomura. This allowed the user to indulge in checking stocks as mentioned earlier, to read the news, weather reports and find out game cheats amongst other things. Again, much like the play cable and game line which we talked about in last week's video, it was intended for games 2 to be eventually downloaded on this thing. But as mentioned, this too never came into fruition. This forgotten modem also came with its own specialised controller, which had additional buttons. These buttons were numeric, which were used to interact with a server and menus. Allegedly, towards the end of its lifespan, some games were in the process of being ported over into a digital format. However, 
this would never really see the light of day until the birth of the Satellaview a few years later, which is a story I will go into detail in in the future. As the Famicom modem didn't deliver on the games front, the modem was understandably a flop. There were issues with connectivity, stability problems and apparently a crash in the stock market at the time in Japan which led to the service itself going bust. Which is hilariously ironic considering it was mainly used to check stocks. Alongside this, on the basis that Nintendo primarily marketed the Famicom as being a children's toy, businessmen and other people who would have been interested in internet banking and trading stocks and shares online were loath to purchase this machine in the first place. I mean, come on, you have to use your hands. It's like a baby's toy. Regarding the Famicom modem, it had one more little feature, which I am yet to talk about because it took place after Nomura ended up pulling out of a deal with Nintendo. The modem was not quite dead yet. Nintendo found a new partnership in the form of the Japan Racing Association. This was the company who were responsible for horse racing and betting in Japan at the time. The modem then became a portal to be able to place bets on the races from the comfort of your own home bringing Nintendo back to their roots in the field of gambling, which is how the company first started out in its early days when they sold illegal playing cards. Amusingly, gambling did cause the modem to have a minor surge in sales, and for a period of a few years in the early 90s, even after the discontinuation of the modem itself. Allegedly, more than a third of all online horse racing bets were placed via this Famicom modem, which meant once upon a time, unlike now, there was in fact a time period in which Nintendo consoles were doing extremely innovative things online. Prior to the official discontinuation of the modem, Nintendo did try to test the US market with this same concept on the NES itself. This was achieved by enrolling the Minnesota State Lottery and via the use of scratch cards, which could be purchased, allowing the lottery to be played using the modem inserted into the NES. It ended up being scrapped very quickly. Rather than the Japanese for a change, this happened due to the rather conservative nature of American values with regards to how they viewed gambling. There was a public outcry from both parents and legislators who were concerned about how easy it would be for children to get addicted to gambling. So I suppose it is no surprise whatsoever that the same people today are trying to get loot crates banned. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the ridiculously overlooked story of Nintendo's first steps into the world of games consoles online. I myself have learned far more going down this rabbit hole than I could have possibly imagined. I love gaming history and am surprised every day with some of the information I discover online. Gaming history is vastly intertwined and connected from one generation to the next and I am regularly noticing events from the past influencing the present. This is why the past is so important as it shapes our very futures. If you know any obscure gaming stories you would like me to research and cover in detail on this channel then let me know in the comment section and I may see what I can string together. Thank you for watching today's video, do not forget to like this video, hit the subscribe button for regular in-depth content on gaming history every single week. My channel Top Hat Gaming Man is partly funded from the fantastic support and donations I receive from my lovely Patreon benefactors. So shout out to Carl Johnson, Suzuka Kobayashi, Stuart McDermott, Greg Hooper, Richard Clark, Harold Webb, Synth Spaces, Kevin Fahaley, David Mountford, Andrew Bazanski, Edward O'Reilly, Michael Keneally, Tom Elliott, Mark S. Hines, Gary Pinkett, The Gaming Muso, Sponge Matt B, Quang DX and all of my other patrons. You people motivate me on a consistent basis to continue to pump out content. So thank you so much for your ongoing monetary support. Cheerio.